All right, hey guys, how's it going? Uh, this is Alan Gardner, a senior lecturer in advanced clinical practice at the University of Central Lancashire. And this is my feedback on the Jack case study. So this is a chap who originally um, attends with sore throat. So uh, in class, you've had the, uh, the sore throat casework to go through and I'm gonna go through my answers to the questions to the, uh, the, the sore throat case study work. Um, and then the, the following week, Jack reattends this time with headaches. So it's continuing that same clinical case, uh, but for multiple episodes. Um, so you get the, uh, the headache superimposed on his recent background through uh, ENT um, head and neck cancer, which is what we're gonna work towards. So we're gonna take this diagnosis, uh, or should I say this presentation of sore throat and go through the, the questions that uh, sort of structure our work up to offering a differential diagnosis based on his symptoms and the signs and clinical examination. Um, and then, uh, as I said, on, on that, that background of his recent uh, head and neck cancer, we'll do the same process again with the headache work. So let's, uh, let's get into it. Parts one and two are the sore throat parts. Uh, and then we've got part three, which is all about headache. Here we're being asked to summarise key information obtained from the history and how this will help shape our working diagnosis. So we can see a full written history here on the right. Uh, I've got some notes in front of me and this is my summary. We have a 40 year old male patient uh, with a five week history of sore throat that's insidious in nature. It's worse on swallowing. Uh, it's radiating into his left ear and it's located down the left side of his neck. Um, it's graded as five out of 10 for severity. It's there constantly. Um, he's come expecting antibiotics. Um, he's also got some left shoulder stiffness that he's attributing to a previous injury. Uh, that makes me think that there might be some uh, spinal accessory nerve involvement potentially. Uh, he also has a history of weight loss, which we can pick up as, as an important red flag. Um, although he is eating and drinking normally, so that, that kind of co co perpetuates that thought that this is potentially unexplained weight loss. Um, he's been unemployed for the, pr the past eight years. Um, he smokes a lot of tobacco and he also uses cannabis. Um, he also has uh, an elevated alcohol intake and a family history of cancer, in particular on his mother's side. Uh, so the important parts to pick out there is that we've got this insidious onset of sore throat. It's slowly getting worse and is now constant um, and sort of moderate pain there, about five out of ten. Uh, there's worse on swallowing. We've got some radiation into the left ear, which is common in um, head and neck cancers, in particular oropharyngeal cancers. Um, that we've got this increased shoulder stiffness that well, there's the potential there for us to allow our patients to just kind of attribute that to an old injury, which he is doing, um, and that we could, I mean, that could be a red herring, but it's also something for us to consider that uh, it might indicate some spinal accessory nerve involvement from uh, something in, in the neck compressing the, the spinal accessory nerve. Uh, now, I've mentioned that weight loss then is one of our red flags, and we'll talk a bit more about that on the, on the coming slides, because um, we've got a question about red flags. Uh, but that's certainly th this idea of unexplained weight loss, especially if he's not changed his diet and he's not changed his exercise level, uh, but he's, he's got some significant weight loss for us to consider there. He's lost about half a stone over three weeks, which for me is a significant amount. Um, he's also uh, got a long history of unemployment, so he's, he's got a, a poor socioeconomic status, which puts him at an increased risk of head and neck cancer. He's also got some other um, social factors uh, which are going to increase his risk of head and neck cancer, such as smoking, um, his, his illicit drug history and um, his raised alcohol intake as well. Um, couple that with his family history of um, cancer on his mother's side. And we, we need to place um, all that information as a priority in, with regards to our formation of differential diagnoses. And that information then feeds into our initial hypotheses. Now I've got three, three groups here. They're not specific at this stage in our information gathering. I think it's okay to use fairly um, broad umbrella terms. So head and neck cancer, the, the most common head and neck cancer is squamous cell carcinoma, um, but with uh, tonsillar cancer as well, we need to consider lymphoma. Um, then it might be, I mean, I've, well, I've placed head and neck cancer at the top of my list because 
as far as my diagnostic thinking goes, I always structure it. Well, what's going to have the biggest impact on a, on a patient's life? So is, is it something life threatening, for example, a cancer diagnosis that we want to, to prioritise or some other acute changes? And for me, this history, it, given its insidious nature, um, the, the red flag of, of weight loss, his um we've already mentioned his his social uh, risk factors like smoking drug use increased alcohol intake that that's that's pushing head and neck cancer further up my list um below there are more sort of inflammatory or infected processes such as tonsillitis pharyngitis or gastroesophageal reflux disease that uh, we can start to try and rule those out and we may want to consider those uh, sort of secondarily after we've um, we've ruled out head and neck cancer but the, the history for me isn't acute enough it's it's too long term I think um, something like an acute tonsillitis or a recurrent tonsillitis would would present very differently um, it would be a shorter history with a more sort of a set of acute symptoms and signs for us to pick up on it may well be pharyngitis because of his history of, of smoking and so well tobacco and, and cannabis use um, but we need to rule out the important sort of life-threatening causes first the same with gastroesophageal reflux disease and, and for that we'd need to, to look more into um, other risk factors for example he's more about his diet um, any any past history of, of things like um, helicobacter pylori infection um, but as I said before really for me this is, this is more about considering our head and neck cancer diagnosis before we consider those um, and it may well be a referred pain from the ear so although he's presented with sore throat that we're seeing that as well the, the, the presenting symptom is sore throat and we see that, that, that there's potentially a referred otalgia that referred ear pain but it may well actually turn out to be the other way around so it could be that the sore throat is actually originating from the ear um, and that this is this is a referred sore throat from a primary otalgia uh, so the next question then is to explore any red flags um, that may cause concern and help shape our development of the hypotheses. Now we've already considered the um, uh, the weight loss and we've got a, a fairly comprehensive list in front of us now which comes from ENT UK which is the government body of ENT surgeons here in, in the UK. Uh, so we've got the, uh, the red flag symptoms. Now this is taken from their list uh, to consider neck lumps, but they, this is a, a set of red flag symptoms with or without neck lumps. And we know that um, Jack is presented without a neck lump, but these are still important red flags for us to pick up on that are gonna increase um, and shape our suspicion of head and neck cancer. So if, if he had an unexplained neck lump um, that's changed over the last three to six weeks, then we would want to prioritize that, but we know that he doesn't, or at least he hasn't found any. And we know that patients often can have neck lumps clinically, but they haven't necessarily felt their own neck to identify them themselves. Um, he doesn't have a history of hoarseness, but this is another important part of our two week wait criteria. Now, now across the UK, there'll be different two week wait referral criteria um, within the North West. There's a specific um, sort of criteria or form to consider uh, when you're working in primary care and you're referring people on, on two week wait rules. And they're, they're updated fairly regularly due to the, uh, the head and neck cancer network. Um, but horse, hoarseness of voice is, is always on there. Um, new onset of dysphagia, so swallowing, swallowing difficulties. Now we know that Jack has some pain on swallowing, but he's still eating and drinking normally. Uh, but he does have this uh, unexplained weight loss despite him continuing to eat and drink normally. Um, any unexplained persistent swelling in the salivary glands. Now, again, we, we haven't really got as far as the, um, uh, the physical examination yet. So it may well be that we'd find something like that if we were to use a gloved hand to, to, to palpate, so we, we do bimanual palpation of the salivary glands within the mouth. Um, he does have some otalgia within the history. We maybe could consider how we, how we structure our questioning to ask about the, the length of time for that. It may well be that he's just noticed the otalgia the last couple of days. It could be that that's been going on for, um, for more than four weeks as well. And it's um, I, certainly clinically, I know that I, I remember one case in um, my time in ENT when there was someone who presented purely with otalgia. That was their only presenting symptom. Um, and they went on to be diagnosed with um, head and neck cancer. That's probably quite unusual um, but it's still uh, that, that, that's one of the reasons that that's on there that if we've got a normal normal otoscopy uh, with more than four weeks of, of ear pain then we need to consider the, um, that as part of our two-week wait criteria and in, in particular there's a theme within ENT of anything that's unilateral so if it's a, if it's a, a one-sided unilateral presentation then that's usually taken pretty seriously um, and seen as 
suspicious uh, of some, some sort of serious diagnosis and, and at the top of our list is, is often head and neck cancer there, especially in the northwest of England where we've got such a high prevalence. Um, the last time I reviewed the evidence around that, it was that we had the, uh, the, the highest incidence within the country, um, probably because of the, uh, the, the high prevalence of people living in poor socioeconomic status. We've got lots of smoking, uh, lots of race alcohol intake as well. Um, so what we do have then with um, uh, Jack is this unexplained persistent sore throat that he's had this for five weeks. Um, we can't we can't really easily attribute that to some inflammatory or infected process. So that's uh, continuing to keep head and neck cancer at the top of our list of suspicions here. He doesn't, from what we've seen so far, doesn't have any non-healing ulcers, or we may we may observe that when we inspect the mouth and our pharynx and examination. Um, it's the same really with the white or red lesions in the mouth or our pharynx and um, they, they, they're sort of um, uh, more sort of, yeah, uh, the, the type of thing that, that dentists are in particular uh, trained to uh, to pick up on and I, I find that those the small white lesions on, on examination can be very uh, subtle signs and quite tricky to, um, to identify in our examination. Our next question then is, yeah, well, you should develop the following list. We need a, a list of Jack's outstanding medical problems and his psychosocial problems and a list of differential diagnoses that are on the, the next slide for me. So our medical problems list then, I mean, obviously at the top, we've got this persistent, unexplained sore throat for five weeks. And I've intentionally worded it in that way because that's, we need to, to process the, the sort of the, the layman's terms that we gather our history in. So we get, we gain our data in patient terminology, but it's our job to then transform that into medical terminology. And that allows us then to create that association between what Jack's telling us and what we see in those red flags. So we translate this, this, um, this history into a persistent, unexplained sore throat, and it's been going on for five weeks. He also has some increased shoulder stiffness that uh, for, for me, this is about considering that, that broader involvement, not just the ENT system, but our cranial nerves as well. Um, if we allow our patients to just kind of explain away their symptoms, for example, a common one is weight loss. People will say, well, I've lost some weight recently, um, but uh, I've not really been too concerned about it. It's our job as clinicians to decide what we're going to be concerned with. It's the same with this shoulder stiffness. How can we explain that his shoulders become increasingly stiff after eight years uh, sort of since his injury? Um, for me, that might be indicative that on examination, we might find that there's some uh, wasting of the, uh, the shoulder accessory muscles, especially given that it's on the same side as his uh, presenting sore throat. Uh, we've mentioned his weight loss quite a lot already, so I'll get into too much there. And his otalgia, so that's the term for ear pain. Um, so we've got ear, potentially referred ear pain on the same side as his presenting sore throat. Uh, lots of risk factors in place to make us suspicious of um, head and neck cancer. And then we move on to our psychosocial problems. So uh, we have a long history of unemployment due to his shoulder injury. Um, he smokes a, a quite a significant amount of tobacco and he also uses cannabis um, as well as his increased alcohol intake. So not only are these um, social issues that are making us more suspicious of head and neck cancer, but these are also issues that make us well, they, they should prompt us to consider, like, is, is he at risk of um, being in a neglectful environment or even potentially self-neglect? Is he at risk of not attending his appointments if we um, refer him for a, a two-week wait referral, which this is all kind of building up to? Um, we need to ensure that he is able to understand the diagnosis and that he's got uh, some written information, uh, an, an, an appropriate um, so sort of accessible level. So making sure that our written information is accessible to the patient. Um, so uh, we also need to consider, I mean, if, if he's about to embark on cancer treatment, um, he doesn't have any tr any transport. So if he's about to, to be offered loads and loads of, um, of appointments, then making sure there's some support there to help him get to those appointments on time, that any, any barriers to him attending really are kind of minimized as much as possible.
Next, we're being asked to explore the significance of the examination findings, and we're asked to relate these findings to potential causes. Now, I've, I've written this case study uh, intentionally reporting through exception. Um, so we're making the assumption then uh, that, the, uh, that, that we've completed a, a pretty comprehensive ENT examination as, to, as per the guidance in the, uh, in the module. Uh, the same with the, uh, the cranial nerves as well. Um, so our reporting through exception then is that we've got some significant asymmetry of the palatine tonsils that we're using this grading system that the, there's the link to Ng, Li and Li 2010 there that explains those grading systems. Um, that the left tonsil, which is the, the side that his symptoms are mainly on, uh, is significantly larger than the, uh, the tonsil on the right. Um, now this is an isolated finding isn't as worrying. If you look at this link by Olo Wasanmi, Wood, Baldwin and Sipal from 2006, they consider that actually the majority of patients who are treated for tonsillar asymmetry as a standalone uh, finding, um, the, the majority of those patients go on to, to, to just have what is essentially a, a normal tonsil on um, histology. However, there is a, a, a minority of patients for whom it does go on to demonstrate head and neck cancer. Um, and as I mentioned before, the most common one is squamous cell carcinoma, but with um, tonsillar cancer, uh, it can often be lymphoma as well. And because of the significance of those, uh, or should I say the, 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 the clinical significance really of, of that, for those small number of patients, it continues to be a, um, a, a reasonable indication, even, even in the absence of any other clinical features, um, just that tonsillar asymmetry is a reasonable um, indication for, for tonsillectomy. Now, as we go on to the head and neck, then we've also got some palpable lymph nodes in the anterior and posterior cervical chains on the left side. So the same side as his enlarged tonsil, we've got some uh, in increased, uh, well, lymphadenopathy, which continues to help us build up this picture of head and neck cancer. And as I mentioned before in the history then, if, I, if, if we see that, that decreased function in the shoulder on the same side as the, the symptoms of the, uh, of the head and neck, um, then that should ring alarm bells that there might be some cranial nerve involvement. And we've got some wasting of the accessory muscles around the left neck and shoulder with decreased power on examination as well. We've, coupled with that is decreased, uh, sorry, some tongue wasting on the left side. Uh, but without deviation. Now, now, if you've seen these clinically, you'll see then that tongue wasting can be quite a subtle sign. So can wasting of the accessory muscles. I think it's, for me, it's one of those sort of one seen, never forgotten type things. Um, that once we've got involvement of the, uh, the, the, the higher cranial nerves, the cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12, we tend to then get uh, so, well, you tend to not see isolated findings there because of the, the close proximity that those nerves are in anatomically, which is why we're seeing involvement of um, cranial nerve 11 and 12 there. Moving on to this next question, are there any pertinent examinations or tests that you'd want to add at this point? Now, we're seeing this chap, Jack, in a primary care setting. So I, I started off looking at numerous blood tests and things. However, I think that that's something that would be dealt with in an ENT clinic. So the priorities for us really are to, to complete a two week wait referral. Um, and as part of that, now, now they're usually seen in, in a, in a one-stop head and neck cancer clinic where they can have an ultrasound of the neck, um, which is reported there and then. They'll have a fine needle aspiration if it's indicated. So that's where they, they use a, a needle transdermally to um, remove some cells and that goes off for, uh, for histological review and they need to be reviewed by a, uh, a head and neck, uh, well ENT head and neck surgeon. So for me that's the, uh, the priority for Jack here. Um, now I notice when I've reviewed some of the work that you've mentioned things such as understanding more about his um, his mental health, his cannabis use and I think that they were all good responses for what can we do there in the clinic um, so, I'm, yeah, I'm just kind of thinking about what, what's the priorities for him here. And I think all of you really picked up on that, that need for that two week wait referral at this time. Next, are you able to identify and justify a working diagnosis at this point? And can you explain the pathophysiology? Now, this has all been working towards um, a diagnosis of head and neck cancer. And I, I mean, I, I'm going to hedge my bets or maybe that's the opposite of hedging my bets and go for um, tonsillar cancer. 
Um, this this is a uh, one one of the very common um, head and neck cancers. Head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is the sixth most common malignancy worldwide. Um, it can often be confined to the tonsillar fossa, uh, but it's also able to extend into adjacent structures. Um, it can commonly spread um, down to the uh, the gloss well, via the uh, the glossotonsillar sulcus, sulcus into the the tongue base. Um, but it's uh, it's frequently superior to the the, uh, the soft palate and nasopharynx as well. It's bound laterally by the uh, the superior constrictor muscle, which tends to, to constrain it laterally. Um, but we get it's common for it to metastasize into the uh, into the lymphatics, which is what we're, we're probably seeing with Jack, which is why we've got that lymphadenopathy on the, the left side of his neck, because that's incredibly common that we've got about 65% of patients will present um, with neck metastases. And in that remaining um, 35%, we've still got a significant amount of people there. It's just 30% of, the, of that remaining will actually have some occult neck disease that's subclinical. Next, we're being asked what, what should be the next steps for Jack's care. Then we need to think about communicating working diagnosis um, and subsequent patient understanding, safety netting, and referral to secondary care. Now, we've already started to cover a lot of this, really. I think we've got a duty of candor for any of our patients, um, so in particular for Jack, then, that we need to, to consider actually being open and, and offering him our diagnosis, even if we've got some elements of, of uncertainty that, that we're, well, if we're thinking, well, am I just being overcautious here? I, I think that, that given the, the, the clinical information, I think we've got a really strong argument for this being a potential head and neck cancer. Um, so we need to be really open with Jack so he knows the importance of the, the diagnosis and knows the importance of ensuring that he attends those, um, th those follow-up clinics. Um, when, I, when I've worked previously in clinics and uh, dealing with two-week wait referrals, it's always disappointing when a patient attends those uh, being unsure about what they are or if they, they find out through the, um, uh, through the, 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 the letter inviting them to clinic that that's the, uh, a potential cancer clinic. Um, so yeah, making sure that we've given Jack the opportunity to ask questions and to, to, to kind of summarise to, to, for us to be uh, confident that Jack understands the, um, the importance of this potential diagnosis, uh, making sure that we've uh, offered good safety netting and again reading a lot of your um, responses. I know that you've considered uh, things like worsening signs and instructions of where to attend um, if, if things do worse, for, uh, worsen, for example, making sure that he's aware of um, sepsis. Uh, think about that uncertainty that well if, if, if we do miss some sort of um, inflammatory process or if he's got an infected process that is superimposed on top of his potential head and neck cancer that, that we've safety netted Jack there for, um, for knowing where to attend and, and what to do in those instances. Um, and that brings us to the end of parts one and two and now we can move on to the headache section. Next we're going to go on to part three which is all about headache when Jack returns to clinic He's had his treatment for, or, or at least is undergoing his treatment for his head and neck cancer, and he reattends with a new headache. So our first question then is, what are our initial impressions? Now, based on the information we've got in the case, we need to assess his headache symptoms, uh, but bearing in mind the context of his recent cancer care. Um, my initial impressions then include that we need to just treat this as a, as a, with a full workup, um, considering a, a comprehensive history and examination, really just like we did in class, we went through that um, that comprehensive approach to the, the history taken, and we talked about the importance of um, of considering those symptoms in the context of his uh, of his recent care. Because as we progress through this case study, we start to see that his symptoms um, pr present as a fairly straightforward primary headache that we'll get more into in a minute or two, but superimposed on that, that background of, of inherent complexity, um, it, it adds some new clinical challenges for us to consider. Next, we're being asked to outline the key differences between common types of headache. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I've already recorded these videos on primary and secondary headaches. Uh, I think almost all of you watched those in the run-up to the teaching day on headache, but essentially we've got primary and secondary headaches. The primary headaches, uh, they don't have a, a specific 
the uh, well-defined etiology that these are headaches that can for the most part be treated conservatively and that they are they don't present as potentially life-threatening illnesses whereas secondary headaches have much more well-defined etiologies they're a more serious uh, cause for concern most of them presenting as medical emergencies um, so for examples of primary headache include cluster headache tension headache migraine we've gone through all of those um, examples of secondary headache are the headache seen in meningitis the headache seen in um, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, and uh, space occupying lesion as well Next, we're being asked, uh, are there any evidence-based approaches you might consider when assessing Jack and his headache and uh, to explore our approach for this? So again, we've done this in class. We went through this in quite some detail. I think there's a bit more detail here, in, particularly in Silberstein 2020, um, that he is offering a very comprehensive approach to patients here. I mean, the, the, the clinical workup always involves a comprehensive history and then uh, for, for headache patients, but a kind of a hybrid of the ENT, cranial nerves and neurological examination that's detailed in the case study itself and comes from uh, Bates guys guide for physical examination. But Silver, Silverstein here then, um, it's based on understanding the etiology of common headaches, which we go into uh, in my YouTube videos that I mentioned before, so on slide 13. Um, we, we went through the uh, well, Morton symptom analysis tool. That's a, a, an expanded version of the symptom analysis tool. We've got OPQRSTU that we use that in class to, to structure our questioning and the way that we summarise the case to ourselves. Now, in particular, then, that Silverstein goes into more detail on associated symptoms than perhaps we touched on in class. Um, and he, uh, he manages to link each of these to uh, potential diagnoses. So in the event the presence or absence of some of these associated symptoms, then we can see how they um, offer to, to, to bump certain diagnoses further up our list of suspicions and, and to kind of help us rule some of them out. So, for example, um, if we're asking patients about um, proceeding or whether or not they, they have any sensations or visual changes in the run up to headache um, or while they've got the headache, then that, that, that helps us um, shape any suspicion of migraine or to rule out migraine as well. And it's the same with our red flags as well. So we've got a pretty comprehensive list of red flags there, again, coming from Silverstein 2020, um, that uh, actually inquiring about some of these specifically within the history and trying to uncover things like neurological uh, signs of neurological deficit within our um, exam is uh, is definitely one of the ways that we, we, we need to go about identifying our red flags there. Um, so, for example, in class, we talked about the thunderclap headache and the way that we can structure our questioning to, to ask, ask patients about that, because I guess there's a, there's a temptation to assume that that's something they're going to voluntarily tell us. And um, I guess a lot of them are going to be your typical band or presentation, but just making sure that we structure our questioning to ask the patient specifically about the severity and the, the, whether or not they've experienced any sudden onset of, of this particular type of headache is, is important. Is there any other information that you would like to know at this point? Uh, now, now for me, I mean, I, I've read through your responses on Teams, and I think you've all come up with some really good examples of what you might want to know there and then in, in the clinic. Um, but for me, probably the, the most important thing at this time then is thinking about continuity of care. And again, we discussed this in class that we want to make sure that we're, we're gaining uh, accurate and good quality information about his recent cancer treatment. Um, so making sure that we're offering that continuity of care by uh, by linking up with his ENT or oncology team, depending on who's looking after that. Um, thinking about, well, has he had any recent investigations? I know in class we talked about the potential for sending Jack for uh, further clinical investigations like uh, CT head. But if he's had one recently, and we know that we often see this clinically, that patients attend wanting further investigations, even though they've had had a full work at previously. So making sure that um, that we understand, well, are, are we the first clinician that he's come to see about his headaches or is it something that's already well known to his ENT or oncology team? Um, uh, whereabouts is he up to with his chemo radiotherapy and is this something that they would expect? Um, and as I said, well, in particular, is it something they already know about? Um, so yeah, so for me, that kind of that offering that, that continuity of care, making sure that there's a link between primary care and secondary care that we're communicating with each other. I think that that's one of our priorities at this point.
Uh, given the information in the history and examination, can you categorise Jack's headache as either primary or secondary? Um, I think we've got a pretty good clinical um, argument then for this being a primary headache that we see in the examination in particular that there's no other focal neurological findings. He has no papilledema, so as we've gone through fundoscopy, we know that papilledema is one of the things that we're looking for um, as a sign of um, increased intracranial pressure. Um, and he's systemically well, there's no systemic illness. So this is likely to be a primary headache. However, we also know that um, the headache seen in intracranial neoplasm uh, often masquerades as primary headache and given his recent history there's that added complexity here so I know we discussed in class this idea that well without that recent background we could just we could quite easily um, see this as a, as a well it's been written intentionally as quite a textbook migraine presentation but it's superimposed on that recent um, clinical history of uh, his head and neck cancer and his treatment so I, I think it's very difficult to actually um, offer a definitive diagnosis at this time. I think it's likely to be a primary headache, um, but that it might be that he's got a new onset migraine because of the stress of his recent treatment. It could be that it's come on as a, as a side effect of his chemo radiotherapy. We would definitely need to consider his recent background and the, the, the potential for this to be um, either a, well, a, a secondary tumour um, or, or some people are just unlucky enough to have a second primary cancer that although that might seem rare and unusual it, it can happen so we need to, to keep our um, our suspicions open to that and not kind of close the door on the potential for someone just having another cancer diagnosis um, because sadly that that does happen at times are you able to use the data from the history and examination to create a list of differential diagnoses give you a top three potential causes of jack's headache well we've already kind of touched on that um, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into the, uh, the pathophysiology now because I've already gone into the kind of the etiology and a bit more detail in my other videos. Um, but I mean, as I've said previously, then my differential diagnoses list always starts with what, what might kill the patient first. And we need to rule that out. So considering that this might be um, some sort of space occupying lesion within his brain that's now presenting with this headache that's very similar to migraine. I think that, that that needs to be considered given his um, recent uh, cl uh, clinical history. Uh, now, as I said before, it's been intentionally written as a migraine history. Um, so we've intentionally sort of presented this, this complexity between migraine and the, the recent clinical history. So that has to be on there. Um, but it could well be that this is secondary to his chemo radiotherapy as well, um, which is, isn't un, isn't unreasonable. Um, so yeah, I think that they're 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 the three that I would place on on my list at this point. So that gets us to the end. Um, to summarise then, we have explored sore throat and headache as two common presentations, and I think that these are broadly applicable to many clinical settings. So in particular, primary care general practice, um, other sort of urgent care or um, A&E uh, areas, but I mean gen general medicine, if you if you were working in, in ENT, um, there's, there's loads of different clinical settings where you're going to come across these, these two um, common presentations. We've considered the importance of sore throat uh, as a presentation of a serious diagnosis, and I think it's easy to be quite complacent with sore throat because it's such a common presentation. If you've worked in primary care or, or urgent care centres, then you will know that you see sore throats a lot, especially through the, the, the colder winter months. Um, and for the most part, these are fairly simple, self-limiting, um, often viral infections that don't really need any sort of, um, sort of definitive treatment. Then you can allow people to self-care with simple analgesics. However, the, the purpose of this then was to start to appreciate when sore throat is something more serious and I guess it, we could have uh, gone for the more typical uh, acute tonsillitis something like that but we wanted to do something uh, that's uh, a bit more niche I suppose but also very uh, niche is probably the wrong word really now that I've said that because it's I mean th this is an incredibly common um, cancer presentation we've seen before within these slides then that it's the sixth most head and neck cancer is the sixth most common um, cancer globally 
We know that it's particularly common within the Northwest where we're based, so it's, it's particularly pertinent then that we understand how to, to work up these, these pa uh, patient presentations um, and uh, when, when to, to go for those two week wait referrals. Um, we've also applied the etiology of common headache types uh, to the workup of this, this patient. So we can cons consider those sort of standalone diagnoses, but also we've considered them with the background of complexity in Jack's case. Um, so that gets us to the end. I really hope that this has been useful. Um, I've enjoyed seeing the, uh, the work that you guys have done on all these questions, and hopefully this has just helped kind of shape that, uh, that, that whole um, case study experience. And thank you very much for watching. If you've got to the end now, uh, I'll leave you to it. Thanks a lot.